Yeah, bowling off with cricket on this fantastic Friday. Well, unless you are a fan of West Indies cricket, of course. Australia, though, registered victory in the first test against the Caribbean side to go 1-0 up in their two-match test series, needing just four wickets to end the Windies' second innings on day three. The hosts dismissed Craig Brathwaite's men in just over an hour before cruising to a 10-wicket victory. We hear more in this recap from Gerard Marsili. Still got to get it done. Yeah, morning, I am morning. West Indies beginning day three, 22 yeah. runs away from making done. Australia bat again, but with only four wickets in hand. Alzari Joseph intent on knocking off the deficit, showing his batting ability with two picture perfect cover drives. But the procession of wickets continued with Joshua De Silva falling again to the well telegraphed short ball plan. So, your strength can be your weakness. And it's never better personified than that little piece of cricket action. Yeah, he's a compulsive hooker. Alzari follows shortly after with the Windies in 8 for 94 and is still one run behind. And then the chance of an innings defeat increased when Moti Ouch. fell to Hazelwood to give the Aussie career best match figures as he ended with 10 cricket. for 138. It took confidence and aggression from Shamar Joseph to force Australia to bat again. Starts. With a, a gorgeous drive through the covers. Kimar Roach joined in with a few shots of his own, with the two putting on a 26 run 10th wicket stand to add to the 55 they shared in the first innings. In the first Shamar innings. added 15 to his first innings 36 before oh, he, he was stumped of Nathan, Nathan Lyon. Lyon West Indies all out for 120, setting Australia just 25 runs for victory. The Aussies were already under little pressure to chase the total and it eased further with two boundaries from Steve Smith. Usman Khawaja was calm at the other end, trying to finish proceedings before lunch. But the Shamar Joseph will leave an indelible mark, not just on the match, but specifically on the left-hander. Well, that's got him hard. Usman Khawaja, there's a bit of claret. It was an outstanding bounce-up. Hopefully he's OK, Usman Kawaja. The late drama only delayed the inevitable. Australia well, easing to 26 without loss to win by 10 back. wickets Australia and take a 1-0 nil series lead. Not what, what we expected and wanted. Um, obviously, bowling-wise, we, we did great, you know, getting 10 wickets um, here in Australia on the 300 runs, I think. That was good. Obviously, we could improve, you know, from, from that as well. Uh, obviously, batting-wise, you know, the top part of it, we didn't get going. Uh, obviously, Kurt played well in the first innings. Um, but yeah, we didn't, we didn't get the, the scores. So obviously, that, that is what let us down. It's fantastic. Uh, you know, every year we always say this is one of our favourite test matches because the crowd feels like the whole city gets behind it. Also, the stadium and, and pitch and all those things is always immaculate. Um, so we absolutely love playing here. And I think this week epitomised that 60-odd thousand people over two and a half days. Uh, on a weekday in a slot where it's not normally there, it's been really well um, supported. So, yeah, pretty awesome. Yeah, the Australian captain, Pat Cummings, ending that recap from Gerard Marsili. Let's welcome now Fazir Mohammed as we recap the contest. Um, good afternoon to you, Faz. I hope you're doing well today. Not doing badly at all. And trust all are well at uh, the Sportsmax headquarters. Yeah, for the most part, we unfortunately don't have Mariah with us today, so I'm stuck with Lance. Um, but that's what you have to deal with um, sometimes. Um, Faz, let me start this way today. Um, the defeat was not unexpected. Coming into this test series, we all knew that it would be an uphill battle for the West Indies, and the first test proved to be exactly that. I want you, though, to talk us through, from your standpoint, one, the positives, um, but also anything that you were disappointed with, even given the circumstances. Yeah, well, well the obvious positive is Shamar Joseph and the bowling effort generally. That, that goes without saying, and indeed, I think the biggest cheer on the final day was reserved for that drive by Shamar Joseph to the boundary first ball that ensured that Australia would be batting again. And it, it just goes to show how much the audience would have taken to him because uh, it, it, it bears repeating. In places like Australia, there's such an admiration for West Indies cricket that, yes, people enjoy beating up on the West Indies now because they can get their own back. But 
there, there, there's a feeling that why can't we see West Indies cricketers of old? So uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but yes, the bowling effort led by Shamar Joseph, uh, the, the overall performance in, in that, that bowling area was, was excellent. The, the, the catching left a lot to be desired. That catch put down by Joshua De Silva, a catch missed at slip as well. You, you can't be missing these opportunities. There's hardly a problem in Australia when it comes to the ball carrying through to the slip cordon. And of course, the batting. And, and this is where it's, a, it's an issue that it's not surprising because you're talking about players, and indeed it was almost laughable in the commentary box, that they were referencing players making their test debuts or with a couple of test matches to their names and first-class records in the high 20s and low 30s. So it, it was almost being ridiculed and you can understand why. So it's the man in which some of these players got out, which was very disappointing because it clearly is going to take them quite some time to get attuned to the requirements of test match cricket. Yeah, and picking up on that point, um, Joshua De Silva, um, reference made to him as a compulsive hooker and getting out hooking twice in this test match. Your thoughts on what happened on the third and what turned out to be the final morning of the game? Well, well basically, you would be looking to someone like a Joshua De Silva uh, to, together with, with his partner would have just come in, Alzari Joseph, to, to show a bit of fight and a bit of backbone. And you know as well that they're setting you up for the hook shot. Joshua De Silva has been playing senior international cricket at the highest level for three years now, 2020. We're now in early 2024. So it's three years plus. And of course, the argument will be put forward that he's still relatively young. But again, let's be real. You're playing the game at the highest level and you should be expected to understand what is happening here. And, and therefore, to fall in the way that he did, to fall in the way that he did in the first innings as well, it's very disappointing. So he has to look at his own game and recognize that he is seen as a leadership potential in a West Indies team. And you, you can't be doing something like that because it sends the, the wrong message to everyone else in the team that, you, you know, you, you're supposed to be thinking the game, be aware of the circumstances around you. And I thought Joshua De Silva didn't have a good match purely on that basis. Yeah, you know, Faz, I want to look ahead to the second test with this question because there is hardly any genuine expectation for much improvement in this team because there's such a wide gap between the quality of the two teams. We have said ad nauseum, ad nauseum that the Australians are along with India, without question, the best in the world. And the West Indies are among the worst test teams in the world. So I'm not sure, you know, why we would expect the results not to be how they are. But I want to ask you this, because I still hear people suggesting that because the squad was so inexperienced, um, the selectors should have gone with a, a Jermaine Blackwood or an Nkrumah Bonner who had played um, at this level before, um, just to... I, I wanted to say sure up, but there's nothing sure about those two batsmen. So let me just say, just to give the, 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 the roster a little bit more know-how because they had been there before. But I'm saying that, you know, Jermaine Blackwood was there last year and they were bowled out for 77 in the Adelaide Test match. Um, do you think this team is missing those more experienced but unsuccessful players in the batting? Well, Lance, rather reluctantly, you've answered the question yourself. Because it makes no difference. West Indies have been to Australia post-1997 on five tours and have almost, not almost, have always been well beaten. We, we, you talk about being dismissed for 77 last time around, just over a year ago. West Indies with Brian Lara, Ramari Sarwan, Jimmy Adams, uh, a host of more experienced players, were routed for 82 on the first day of the series in Brisbane in 2000-2001. West Indies have been routinely beaten inside three days when they go to Australia and indeed other parts of the world. So anyone foisting this argument still really just fell out of an Aki tree last week, Monday, because I mean, you can't be serious. With, with that sort of discussion, uh, again, you just simply have to look at the numbers and the results of test series played in Australia post-1997 by the West Indies to recognize that the problem goes way beyond the cosmetics of putting in players who've been there before. 
Yeah. And, you know, I want to make the point that Jermaine Blackwood has been unconvincing, and some may feel that he was a little unfortunate not to be in this setup. But, uh, Faz, Jermaine Blackwood has played more test matches than Anderson, Montgomery, Everton, Roberts. And, 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 and he's, he's, he's still not shown that he belongs at, at, at the level. The West Indies cricket team is in real trouble. And of course, in fairness to Jermaine Blackwood, he's had his moments playing a winning test match innings against England in Southampton in the COVID-19 series of 2020. He's had a few beautiful knocks along the way. Uh, so so, so no, let's not not give him some credit. Yeah. But but again, this is... Well, I, I use the word unconvincing. So I, I accept the point that he has had some good innings, as you just pointed out. But un I, I, would, I, would, I would still suggest that he's been unconvincing as, an, as a test cricketer. Correct. And, and the only reason people are arguing about his credentials is because we are in the era where we've accepted mediocrity. So that averaging 30 or 31 or 32 or 29 is, is considered good. We are in an era over the last 20, 25 years where players, check the, people can check the records themselves of batters in West Indies cricket who played 30, 40, sometimes nearly 50 test matches averaging no more than 20 odd just just think contemplate that for a moment so so we are now in this era where people feel they can legitimately argue the credentials are for someone not because they are they are likely to perform on the top of stage but it just happens that they are only marginally better than the very mediocre in which we have so many yeah and i think the selectors will probably feel that given the players available to them for this series um they didn't have m many options. I would say that I, I was disappointed in the returns of uh, Alec Athenes because I think he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a talented batsman. And I'm hoping that he does better in the Brisbane test because um, he didn't do well in Adelaide at all. Uh, but I think he's a lot better than, than what we are seeing so far. And this is the disappointing element, uh, Lance, because I, I did mention someone like an Alec Athenes, who you'd expect to, to, to lead from the front. Yes. Uh, uh, Mackenzie, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful, I'm happy that he proved me wrong in saying that he should be dropped. He got a half century, got 20 odd. But again, these young players, it's almost as if, Lance, you have to ask them to insulate themselves from the acceptance of mediocrity all around them. And that's why I reference, and forgive me for having to do so, to reference George Headley and so many others, because you're talking about a different era. You're, you're talking about a, a, a time when people ex were expecting you to score hundreds. And just to, to add to the dilemma facing the West Indies going into the next test match in a few days' time at the Gabba, it's a pink ball test match, day night. It's a seeming trap at the Gabba, as everybody knows. All of the Aussie fast bowlers are chomping at the bit to play in that match, and therefore it's going to be even tougher. And, and of course, if we were playing a proper test match series of three, four, five test matches, you'd say, well, let's give these players a couple of test matches to prove their worth. But now you're in a situation where you're asking yourself, what's the point? Maybe we should give some of those on the sidelines who obviously won't be able to do any worse, may not do significantly better, but this is the dilemma that, that we now face. And that's why players like Athenes, Kirk McKenzie, those with a little bit of experience, you really want to see them br bring that to bear. And of course, the top two, Craig Brathwaite and Tej Narayan Chandapol, they were very disappointing as well. It's not good enough to try to survive in Australia because you won't. Uh, again, for, for, for those who might be saying, well, you know, you, you never bowl up a line properly. True. But the, the, the evidence is there. You hear the former players talking about it. You hear the discussions taking place. That in a place like Australia, with pace and bounce, you either defy it a little bit, but you've got to look to score. You've got to look to get on top of the bowlers. Because eventually, the unplayable delivery is going to come, just as we're looking at it there on the first morning, with the first attacking shot from Tej Narayan Chandapol. And the Aussies hardly ever miss anything that comes their way. Yeah, very much the case, fans. You know, I have a lot to say specifically on that Jeremy and Blackwood issue. I have said a lot on that Jeremy and Blackwood issue. I am one of those who feel he was unfortunate not to be named in this squad going to Australia. And not because he is the greatest in the world, but because, as you pointed out, among a, a mediocre group, 
Um, he might be among the best of those, and given his experience and everything else, but I, I don't want to belabor that point, not on this fantastic Friday, as the producers um, dub it. So I'm going to talk about the youngsters, Faz. The under-19 team who began their World Cup campaign, a disappointing start to the World Cup campaign against the host nation, South Africa. South Africa making 285. The West Indies, in reply, bowled out for 285. And 54. And here is my issue, Faz, and maybe you can help me with this because I am struggling to understand why, as a region, we are struggling so badly to understand how to play this 50 over game and specifically when it comes to the batting and structuring and innings of. 50 overs. We see it so often with the senior team where they fail to bat 50 overs. And now we see it with the under 19 team chasing 285 to win Faz. Well, 286 to win. You score 254 all out. You've lost all 10 wickets because everybody is going all guns blazing. And then you have 59 deliveries to spare. And you are on the losing end. I cannot understand it. I couldn't understand it at 73 for 5 after 10 overs. In fact, there was no point of the innings I could understand it. And in many ways, I'm happy they lost that match first because I don't think that's the way they should be winning cricket games. And if, if they went on to win it, probably would have sent the wrong signal. Anyhow, my rant is over. Faz, it's your time. Well, you've stolen all my thunder, so there's nothing left for me to say because that is precisely the point. You know, it, you, you've got, even if you're in the groove, you're in the mood and the shots are being played and so on, wickets are falling. Surely there's, someone should be sending a message, look, we have all these over still. No need to take any chances. We're ahead of the required rate. We are way ahead of the required rate. You know this South African left-arm fast bowler who was the, the, the man of the match with five wickets and really made the difference because no one could handle him with, with, the, with the pace that he had, certainly not at the top of the order. And then at the end, you, you basically have got to be aware of the situation. How many overs does he have left? How many overs do we have to go? At what rate is required? Of course, you don't want to take it down to the last over. But as you said quite correctly, to be dismissed with almost 10 overs left in a match that you've lost by 31 runs, that speaks to a chronic failure to be aware of the situation that you're in. Yeah, having said all of that, Joel Andrew played a fabulous knock, 130. Brilliant. I, I mean, looking at some of the shots, mm -hmm. there was one that he played off the toes over Lamont. Mm -hmm. that, that was just like a whip. Oh, oh, I mean, you could see the class in the player. You could see someone who has a tremendous, not just shot making, but all the fundamental tools related te to technique. But added to all of that, you've got to be able to be aware of the situation around you because it's all well ended to score a brilliant hundred and have everyone talking about it in your ability. But when your team has lost in a group of just four, which includes England and Scotland, you've already put yourself on the back foot to get into the next round. Yeah, and you know what, Faz, one of the things I like about some of the West Indies on a 19 teams that I've seen in the last two or three cycles is that they have batting down to 9 and 10. Um, you know, these, these uh, batsmen towards the, the, the lower half of the batting order are, are primarily bowlers, but we saw signs today that, that, that they can bat, Nathan Edward and company. And, and this is, the, well, again a part of the, the, the amount of limited over cricket that is being played, that you're required to be able to contribute lower down the order. The idea of the pure rabbit at, at 11 or 10, I mean, Shamar Joseph was a classic case in point in the, the, the brief test match, the ability to score runs. But more than anything else, Lance, and let's, let's again remember, two years ago when the West Indies hosted the tournament, the home side failed to advance to the knockout stage of the competition, losing their final game to Sri Lanka in St. Kitts. So again, for all that talent, for all that ability, you have to have that space between your ears 
functioning properly. And if it isn't functioning properly, there would have to be someone or others outside who would be able to send that message, look, this is the situation. Don't give it away. Just see off this guy. See off this person. Be aware. You need to keep wickets in hand for when the real danger bowler comes on. Th these are not issues that you, you should think should be brand new because I think anyone growing up in any sport, whatever the sport is, would learn these fundamentals about appreciating where you are in the situation of any game. Yeah, and I think I take Ricardo's point that in a, in a manner of speaking, it's, it's good that they didn't win the game today because their approach was wrong. What I want to say, though, on the other side of the coin is that I think there is quality in this team. And I think if they execute properly, they can recover and do well in this tournament. And that is the disappointing element about it, Lance, because, yes. again, referencing the test match, you see the ability with the bat. Yes. But again, it's that headspace. It's that ability to think the game. We often talk about cricket being a thinking man's game, but I think it's really exaggerated uh, because I think every sport is a thinking player's game. You've got to be able to think on your feet in almost every sport. And, and therefore... They have the ability. There's no question about it. This talk about the cupboard being bare and all of that, it's, it's true to the extent that these players across a number of years are not translating that talent and blending it with the thought process and the awareness of the situation to ensure that they develop and therefore the West Indies can start winning regularly once again. Yeah, you said it, fans, and I'm happy that you said it. The disappointment, the major disappointment with the under-19 performance is that I think this is a genuinely good team that can go far in this tournament. And I am just disappointed to see continuously West Indies teams lose, especially 50 over matches, because they are not thinking the game in the way that they should. And today, again, was another example of that. Anyhow, that's that for today, Faz. We will, as we always do, do this again next week. will be the next time, and we look forward to it. Thank you. Fazir Mohammed, stay with us. A lot more to come today on the Sports Bank Zone, including an interview with the reigning world 100 meter hurdles champion, Daniel Williams. That's coming up.